Green is the new gold. You know, put a green label on a product, it helps us, and ultimately, it's going to lead to some kind of utopia. Now, I know there is a level of skepticism about it, but I mean, let's be honest about it. If we go back 30 years, there were no green labels on any products. Okay, you might have had recycled toilet paper. That was about it. And it does help. It helps us as consumers have a power and feel that we are leveraging that power and we are choosing particular things. And it's a start, no? Absolutely. In fact, I would like to start by understanding very well what the word green means. Google, in fact, defines it as not harmful for the environment. And for many of us, green can be a synonym of bio or organic, because we often see it on labels of products, right? But unlike uh, green, organic and bio, um, they comply with a clear standard and they are certified. So in the EU, when we buy a bio uh, food, we know exactly what it means. That's totally not true about green. And this is a perfect opportunity for some companies to use green to greenwash. This means they, they distort or exaggerate the positive impact of their products on the environment. So I would like to show you two popular examples of greenwashing. Let me ask you. How many of you have ever bought a recycled paper notebook believing you're saving a forest somewhere? Can you raise up your hands, people? I have to say, I have been also a victim before. Uh, before I went to design university and found out how paper was actually made. In fact, now, paper can only be made from certain types of trees, and especially when they are young. So you cannot just go and cut any random tree in the forest, and especially not a century-old sequoia, and make a, a paper out of it. There are the so-called uh, managed timberlands, where trees are grown much like crops or vegetables, meaning they get harvested every few years and then new ones are planted. In some cases, paper manufacturers even engage to plant more trees than the ones they cut. So... All right, I, I hear you. I hear what you're saying, and it's true. I mean, I think we're aware that some people might be manipulating this for marketing purposes, but at least the whole concept of green is in there in people's minds, and we're on a journey. No, it's a journey, and maybe they're using it, but at least when they go into the boardroom and say, but how are we going to sell this? Let's find a way to make it green. There's some level of sort of... Uh, of thinking going on in there. There's a level of awareness, which is good, no? Absolutely. In fact, buying a recycled notebook is a good thing because it helps reduce volumes at landfills and extends the life of paper. So it's a valid reason to buy a recycled paper notebook, but not mm, for the reasons they make us believe, saving the Amazon forests, for example. It's just a fairy tale that makes it easier to sell. All right, so you have this concept of greenwashing, which sounds a little bit like money laundering as well, <laughs> uh, so it's quite, uh, which is, is quite, quite exciting. Um, any other examples of green? I mean, you know, okay, we have to be careful here, but I mean, can you get close? You don't have to name names, but re we've had the, no the notebook. What else out there is a typical example of greenwashing where we are really, you know, they're pulling the wool over our eyes? There's a popular one, fashion. Uh, you must have seen those brands advertising their new collection as green because it features garments with a certain percentage of um, organically sourced cotton or linen. There's the keyword blend in there. If you examine the label of the garment closer, you'll see that indeed there is a certain percentage of organically sourced natural fiber of some sort, and the rest is synthetic fiber. What this mixed fiber means for the environment is a total mess. While a 100% cotton t-shirt will decompose in a matter of weeks, mixed fiber garment is not biodegradable and extremely difficult to recycle. So at the end of the day, 
having some percentage of sustainably sourced natural fiber is certainly better than having none, but it's far from uh, being the reason enough to call a brand green. It can be a first step, a commitment, but for sure not the end of the story. Okay, so if I understand you, you're saying green is not the new gold, it's a very bland statement and it allows companies to get away with, you know, manipulating us and pulling on our green heartstrings exactly. and sympathy. Exactly. Not all that glitters is gold. All right then, not all that let's glitters is gold. Let's burn this one. Three, two, one, let's tear this down. Lovely. Let's just scrunch it all up. And that's number one done with. So, this myth should be burnt. Whoa. So that's myth number one. The next one, go vegan in materials. Okay, now this is one I think you're going to have a difficulty with, really. Because, I agree. All right, off you go. You go first and I'm going to come back at you, okay? That's a tough one, but let's again start the same way. First, understand exactly what we're talking about. So. Vegan, in the context of nutrition, we all know, is a diet that excludes any animal-deriving foods and focuses only on plant-based foods. So far, so good, right? Well, let's then take this definition and apply it to materials, then. A vegan material would be animal-free and plant-based. And this is where a lot of confusion is created on the market today. Well, now I'm going to do something that's counter logic. I'm actually going to share with you some great vegan materials that I believe in. For example, vegan leather, that's the most uh, widely used animal deriving material, right? So, vegan leather is plant based. And nowadays, there are many startups out there that are doing great work experimenting with pineapple leaves, mushrooms, cactuses, um, grape um, waste, corn waste, among many others. These materials do have a lower environmental impact and they're uh, easy to decompose. The challenge with these materials is that they still need to get better in performances to match real leather in terms of resistance, durability, and so on. There is some people also argue that, okay, but what if we start, we stop using real leather and we start uh, just planting corn um, because we want to make uh, vegan leather out of it, it's going to still have a huge environmental impact. Yes, that's absolutely true. In fact, what I favor are um, vegan leathers that work with waste. So material that otherwise will not be used in any way. So they're not adding anything, any um, extra weight to our planet, but they're using what would otherwise be just thrown away. All right, hold it there because I get you. So just saying, let's go vegan, this is a vegan-based material, is not enough. It's, it's, it's got to, it's got to be, go full circle. But let, let me, before, because I know you've got a lot of arguments there, but let me, let me just get a show of hands. Who here would buy a fur coat, brand new? Put your hands up. I don't see any hands in the air there. People don't want to buy fur coats. People don't, you know, it's not just about the products that go into landfill, it's also caring about greater part of society. So presumably, it might not be achieving everything you want to achieve, but at least, you know, it's saving the minks, it's saving, I don't know where, you know, little foxes and things like that. I mean, that's a very extreme example, I know, but it's still an example. Okay, I'm going to make a counter question. I didn't see any hands up for the fur coat, but how many of you guys um, are vegan? I don't see many hands up. And everyone There's else, one hand up. I'm just guessing that everyone else just eats meat. Whoever eats meat or animal deriving products, raise their hand. Okay, so <laughs> this <laughs> is exactly where the catch is. Mm. 
and I'm not advocating in buying fur coats here, but as long as we eat meat, there will be um, byproducts from the food industry. In fact, statistics show that meat consumption in the past decades has only been rising for two reasons. First is, um, of course, population increase, and second is that population over the world is generally getting richer. So people spend more money, they eat better, they eat meat. And leather is a byproduct of, um, of the food industry. So byproduct means that people don't breed animals for that specifically, but they find a way to use it. Of course, there are um, better ways to process leather and worse ways to do so. In the developing countries where a lot of leather is processed, they use heavy chemicals and a lot of water to do it. That's certainly not good. In Europe, especially in Italy, where I work, there are a lot of wonderful examples of tanneries that use vegetable tanning or chrome-free tanning and closed water loops and many other methods to make their businesses more sustainable. I can give you more extreme examples here of using animal byproducts. I'm, was, I'm just coming from Milano Design Week, where I saw this um, <clears throat> kitchen utensils made out of animal blood. I know it sounds creepy, I know it sounds gross, but if you see it, the bowl, it was a bowl, it looks and feels as a mix between plastic and um, ceramics, so it's very neutral, I would say. And even though it sounds so even violent, oh my God, blood, I mean, I don't want to eat from a bowl made out of blood. The fact remains that when we kill animals, there is blood out there as, um, as well as feathers, skin, horns, and so on. And companies are doing great job. For example, there is another startup working on uh, using horn like from the cows, horns, or um, oyster shells, and mixing them with biopolymer, and then 3D printing with it. So these are all ways to use 100% of what we have already. OK, all right, and it sounds very innovative as well. I'm just thinking a bit into the future, you know, utensils made of human blood. I mean, that could help vampires, for example, couldn't it? You know, you wouldn't have to go yeah, out it's at midnight. Not, it's and... not a good marketing story so far, but I believe it has future. All right, then. OK, so three, two, one, let's tear that one down. Excellent. So no more vegan materials. This myth should be burnt. So this one is one that I have um, issues with myself, so I think uh, I'm a little bit closer to you on this one already. <laughs> sustainable sources equals sustainability. And it's a word that is flashed around everywhere. Everybody is talking about sustainability, and I really think that we do not understand it too much. But I myself, I would, I would follow that word. I'm heavily attracted to that word, probably even more than green, because I think, yeah, this is something where I'm doing something really worthwhile and valuable. Yeah, for this one sounds plausible. And in order to expose it, I would like to take you on a journey. That's the journey of, of my profession, basically, as a color and material designer in the automotive field. One of my goals is to research and introduce new sustainable materials. So let's imagine that Together, we find this great new sustainable vegan leather, let's say. It's made out of corn waste, so no extra corn is being grown out there for it. So let's take it and apply it to a car seat and take it to production. This is what, what's going to happen. So st step number one is optimizing this vegan leather in order to make it um, compliant with all the regulations and of quality and safety. Um, this means that, of course, you don't want your 
black car interior fading out in a few months, or your dashboard getting all crinkled um, after a few days under the hot summer sun, right? So in order to achieve this high performance of the material, we would need to add different layers of coating to uh, make it more fire retardant, abrasion resistant, and so on. This, however, will decrease its ability to decompose, but it will serve to make a, a more long-lasting car, right? Because if we start uh, ditching our cars every few months, that's certainly not sustainable. So we are working towards a product that's as high quality as possible that can endure a lot. Okay, then once the uh, vegan leather is ready. We're going to upholster it into a cover and wrap it onto the foam. To make it simple, the foam is a plastic-based material. A very popular indus industrial uh, process, it's called bonding, putting this um, vegan leather cover and foam together. Bonding is, puts them together so tight that they become inseparable and they uh, become unable to recycle. This is a process that's, for example, very good for airbag deployment, so safety, certainly primary focus for a car, but again, will create difficulties at the end of the life. And that's not the end. Then we take our bonded um, foam and upholstered cover and put it on the structure. It's a metal structure, which also has some plastic components like switches and um, electrical cables. This is what, generally speaking, a seat is made from. And keep in mind that a seat is just one of the many complex components in a car. And what happens at the end of the story even though we started, yes, with a sustainable sourced, real nice material, we still end up with a seat that's presenting a lot of issues in terms of recycling and sustainability in general. So from this little thought experiment, I would like to have two important takeaways. First is that sustainable sourcing is good, it's important, it's a first step, but it's not enough. Because as long as we have a linear mindset of make, use, and dispose, problem with sustainability will, will go on. We need to transfer to circular way of thinking, to circular economy, where at the end of the life of a product, it can be separated into its materials, which can be then reused or recycled. And my important second takeaway is that design today is about sustainability. It will be more and more about sustainability, but it's not our only criteria. We also have to make sure that products meet quality requirements, um, safety, and also cost efficiency, because even if we were to come up with this great sustainable car that costs three times as much as its competitors in the segment, you may be real <laughs> sustainability enthusiasts, but probably you're not going to be able to afford it, so it doesn't make any marketing sense. So it's all about making compromises and meeting in the middle. So if I understand you, it should be 360 sustainable. Yes. It's got to go in one yes. full circle, and then it's a sustainable source product, and it means something for the environment, whereas this, this means nothing if it's just sustainable. Yeah. Three, two, one, let's take that down. Okay, so a new insight into the word sustainability. This myth can also now be burnt. All right, we've gone through these three myths, okay? But I, I think one of the reasons why a lot of people have come along here is because they are actually interested in leveraging their power as consumers. So 
Give us some advice. What can, you know, what can these people do to feel that they're doing something so that at the end of the day they feel positively when they, they nipped into Spar and bought some stuff and went home and they don't feel guilty about it? I would like you uh, to call out to you. Ask companies to be specific. It's not just about sneakers in general or cars in general, it's irrelevant. What you want to know as consumers is how much this precise pair of sneakers of this brand costs. And this is what startups like um, Carbon Fact do. Um, for now, I saw they have a, a really cool list of sneakers out there. I'm really excited to see this expanding into more and more um, fields of um, industrial fashion design. And it would be great to see it into cars. As, as you saw in the example before, it's a complex and long process to come up with one number. but. If you enter into a dealership and instead of asking, oh, is this uh, model green? Of course, you're going to get the answer. Oh, yes, that's our new super green model. You can ask them, uh, can I see the mm, um, analysis, the life cycle analysis of this uh, model and maybe compare between two models? This is where we get specific. OK, so you're actually asking, are you, we can actually push back. And after a while, these people in the car showrooms, uh, rooms where they will start th saying, hey, we've got issues here with this. We need to know more about it. And they'll push back. And that's another way of influencing. That's what you're saying. Yes. And just before we go, because we're right at the end of time, what things can we look for now? I mean, you mentioned bio. Bio's good, OK? Is it organic? Organic's good. We should go for that. Yes, because we already have legislation for that. And I'm also calling to uh, policymakers to stand up and make more clear legislation for products, not just foods. Thanks very much. Let's give a big round of applause Thank to you, everyone. Teresa Nikolova. Thank you.